is Matthew Cole, I'm the co-chair of the Research Support Services Committee. My co-chair is Maria Frenetovic, right there. And uh, this is the fourth year that uh, the Research Support Services Committee has uh, sponsored Research Day. I hope you're gonna come back in. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Research Day is our opportunity as faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students to showcase what we're doing as academics, as graduate students, and as recipients of the Presidential Undergraduate Award. And after the Presidential Colloquium, which will, this will go till 12.30, across the hall is our poster session in the Architecture Gallery. And this year we have more posters than we've ever had before. We have 55 posters this year. And that's represented by a large collection of undergraduates. So I, I hope you get a chance to um, review all the posters, speak to the presenters, and ask them to tell their story. Tell them, they'll, they'll ask them to tell you what's on that poster. And that gives both students good experience and it gives us as faculty the motivation we need to keep doing what we do because we get to publish but we love to talk to you about our research. Okay, moving right along, I wanna start with a message from Dr. Modgill who's unable to join us this year, but he did write to me a message that he wanted to make sure I translate to everybody and it is as follows. Dear colleagues, since its inception, Lawrence Tech has engaged in applied research that has resulted in transformative innovations. Today, we celebrate the same proud tradition showcasing our faculties and faculty mentored student research. Many exhibited presentations demonstrate outstanding efforts and results of undergraduate research, a defining strategy of Lawrence Tech. We also experienced the address by the Presidential Colloquium keynote speaker, Dr. Leo Shamir, whose work has attracted a worldwide audience and brought added prestige to Lawrence Tech. It is very difficult for me not to be here with you today at events that are so close to my academic passion. Today, however, I'm working on another critical and strategic initiative by visiting with our LTU partner universities in China. Thank you to all who are making Research Day possible and best wishes to those who present their scholarly work. With gratitude, President and Professor Modgill. So, on behalf of the President, I want to welcome you to Research Day. And um, I want to thank, before I turn it over to our Provost who will say a few welcoming words and then she will turn it over to the Dean who will introduce our keynote speaker. I just want to thank our uh, presenting sponsor, Pharmaco Incorporated, which is a new um, startup company that does research on plant-based pharmaceuticals. And um, their corporate representative is unable to join us today. Um, but we always like to acknowledge um, the presenting sponsors. So thank you to Pharmaco. Now I am going to turn it over to um, Dr. Vaz. Thank you everybody, thanks for joining us this year. And let me just say next year, the fifth annual research day will be April 7th. So we hope to see you then. Thank you very much. I need to ask a favor. I need to ask everyone that is on the back to please move to the front. So if you do not mind, I know that is, uh, you know, is asking a lot, but frankly, you all have been in classes and you know what it means when the whole back is full of people and the front there is no one. So thank you very much, Shri. Thank you very much for being a great example. Okay. I think there are some people that still are on the back, so. <laughs> you are not on the back? Okay, I'm going to ask just another time. If you do not mind to move, do you know? Yeah, I have to tell you that if nothing else for the, do you know, Shamir is going to speak and he's a lot nicer to speak in the room that, that is fuller versus 
having all the back row completely full and no one in the front. So thank you very much. So first of all, I want to welcome everybody to the research day overall. Uh, as always, it's really impressive by what I learned from, uh, you know, just learned from Matt. We are going to have even more, even more posters than what we had last year. Uh, this morning we have several sessions. I went, every year I go to a different one, so this year I went to, to architecture and actually there were five or, five or six people that, you know, did presentations were very good. Last year I went to, to engineering and there is no doubt that uh, we are doing m not just more but actually better research and more interesting. And so it's very nice, as you know, uh, research, we will never be a research university and is not what we want to be, but it's really important that for faculty members to do research because here at Lawrence Tech they engage their students too. And they engage undergraduate students, they engage graduate students, and that is what makes education, and in particular the education of Lawrence Tech and Matic so unique. So I want to thank everyone that was, uh, that participated already in the morning, that, is, uh, that are going to be here and then are going to be in the posters to, for coming here. I also want to thank the students. I know that many of the students have posters outside. I know some, in some cases that we actually require students to come here, but it's really very important to see the growth of what we see in the research that is done by students. So I want, okay, I want to thank you for your hard work, and I want to assure you that because you did the research, you actually had a better education than students that actually didn't do it. And so we want to use you as examples for the future to make sure that uh, we tell other students why they should be involved in research. Okay, now, uh, I would like to introduce Dean Moore, that is actually going to introduce our key s keynote speaker for the day. Uh, this is the fourth time that we have the presidential colloquium here at Lawrence Tech. I was going to say that President Modgill was sorry that he couldn't be here, but you already know that, and so I have to fill his shoes. Of course, I'm not as a good speaker as he is, as you know, or I do not know any jokes. You know, so unfortunately, that is never part of my repertoire. But I would love, but I would like to now introduce Dr. Moore, that is going to introduce our note, note speaker. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Lior Shamir. Um, when I was thinking about this, it's hard for me to imagine that um, he's been here only for five years. S he joined us in 2010, and um, he has accomplished so much. And I was thinking about some adjective to describe him, and three words come to mind. One is unique, he's a unique person, he's a creative person, and he's, he is transformational. So I want to tell a little story about each of this. Um, he is unique in the sense that when he first came to uh, interview and after he accepted a job, I asked him where else did he apply and he said nowhere, just Lawrence Tech. And it was clear that you know he had a very stable job at uh, NIH before. So he didn't really need a job. but. To this day, I don't know, somehow he chose us. Somehow he, <laughs> he thought maybe Lawrence Tech would be a good fit for him, and I'm so glad that he actually made that choice. Um, he, he actually came here to pursue his career, and uh, it has gone very, very, very well. And he's creative in the sense, so the first semester he came to the campus, he told me that we need a different kind of education. He said, um, I, have n I have not learned anything or I can't remember a thing in any of the lecture course I ever attended. So he said, I'm not gonna teach our students um, 
by lecture. I'm going to teach them by project or research. So I said, at the time, his chair was uh, David Bidjatter. He said, Dave and I both said, go ahead and try it out. <laughs> and, and that have evolved to today, we heard about the Cree Initiative. He's really the leader behind that. Now, in terms of transformational, um, the OR has transformed our institution uh, from, from the past. Um, I, I usually categorize uh, institution as either research one or teaching institution. And we were mostly the latter in the, you know, in, in, the, in our existence. But I think Lior has transformed us into something that's not our one, not strictly teaching, but is some hybrid in between. And I, it's, it really should be that way. It should be teaching, informing, research, and research informing. It should be two tied together. And Lior has done that very, very well. I just want to end by uh, paraphrasing Dr. Magill's um, speech at his uh, State of University speech uh, when he talked about Lior Shamir. And he said he's seeing a lot of Nobel laureates and he has seen their lectures and look at their publications. But he has never met someone like Lior Shamir who published this uh, Beatles um, article and immediately become a sensation, and it was written up in more than a hundred news outlet. So with that, I'd like to invite Lior to come up here. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for coming here. So uh, let's see. So we are fortunate to live in a very interesting time in science. And it, the, it, it's so interesting, not necessarily because the discoveries in science the, that we have in our time are more important or more exciting than in a uh, recent previous generation, but mostly because the way science is being done is being transformed. And everything is now is be becoming virtual. So let's say data become virtual and algorithms are virtual and analysis tools are virtual and workflows are virtual. And that really transforms science. So different people can work on, a, on the same experiments, for instance. Each one can be in a different continent, but they might not even communicate directly with each other. They might not even know about each other, but they still work on the same, uh, on the same experiment, and that's because of uh, the virtualization. And that's very different than the way science has been done in the past uh, 500 years or so. Then you, know, you have an hypothesis, and then you design an experiment, and then you collect the data, and then you analyze the results. So obviously that model is continue, it, it, well, it still lives and will continue to live, but the way major, the way the, way the primary science is being done today is uh, moving very strongly towards virtualization. And you see the main scientific project today and now, and I'm gonna give you examples uh, for that are all being uh, virtual now. And, but the main message for institutes like Lawrence Tech is that now everyone, with the virtualization, everyone has the same chance, the same um, ability to make uh, substantial scientific discoveries. They actually, the high school kid has this access to the same resources as the most prestigious scientist. So the only difference between them is not the accessibility of resources or materials or facilities, research facilities, but actually the knowledge that they have or the experience that they have. But everyone has the same chance. So the schools like Lawrence Taylor are smaller, can use that model to really build on research. Well, that's, uh, if you remember for two years ago, um, Don Carpenter was talking about the yellow brick road, the, what's the solid path that led him through uh, to a career in, in, in research. And that's uh, fine, that's how it works for most people, I believe. It's not quite how it worked for me. Uh, that is, that's my <laughs> share of the yellow brick wall. Now, that, that, that's a piece. <laughs> That's a piece of the actual yellow brick wall, by the way. That's, uh, I got it from uh, a student that used to work with me, Joe George. Uh, his role in the movie, he was a, an effect specialist. His role in the movie was to create the explosion effect. And after the, the, he did that, he picked up some of the pieces, some of the wrecks, and I ended up getting one of them. But, so what I'm saying is that some people walk on the yellow brick wall, some people blow it up to a million pieces, and I'm <laughs> closer to the second part, uh, the second kind. 
uh, not blowing up to a million pieces, but uh, I've, I've never took the highway. I took the side roads. The roads that are, you know, you don't see that many people there. They're less crowded. Uh, it takes longer maybe to get there, to get to your destination, but also they're more interesting. And normally you see things that you don't see on the highways. I'm going to show you some examples of that. I'm going to start with that, the Large Synoptic Sky Survey. Now, LS or LSST in short. Now, LSST is the next big thing in science. It's uh, the number one project of the NSF. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, investment. Uh, President Obama knows about it. He mentioned it a few times. So uh, it's widely, widely agreed that there are several Nobel Prizes in it uh, when it uh, sees first light in 2022 or 2023. So um, that's... Uh, what makes it so, uh, uh, so important is that even if it was a regular telescope, it would have been one of the biggest in the world, an 8.4 meter telescope, it would have been one of the biggest. But wh what makes it a real monster is that it's not just a telescope, it's a robot. It works all night, every night, or supposed to work uh, when it starts, uh, all night, every night, collecting a lot of information, and that's why it's agreed that there are several Nobel Prizes in there, because it's going to create a database like nothing uh, even uh, remotely like it. And that's the team of the telescope. With our plan, where it's a pretty big team, about 300 people working uh, on, this, uh, on this project. That's a scientific collaboration. Now, each person in that, uh, in that picture is kind of like the big name in the field. And if somebody wants to get to the collaboration, the other people already inside need to vote for that person. So it's some sort of like a scientific fraternity of some sort. So, um, so the question is, what am I doing in that picture? I'm definitely an outlier there. So why am I there? And I'm going to show you that. So that's the digital camera of LSST, what you see up there. Uh, it might not look so big. You think of a digital camera, it's something that might fit in your pocket. But it's actually the, the size of a minivan. And its resolution is like about 1,500 HD screens connected to each other. It's a very high resolution. It's cooled down to about minus 20 Celsius. And it's going to collect about 20 to 30 terabytes of data every night to create the world's largest database. So uh, somebody needs to analyze this data. It's not possible to look at it manually or even a very small fraction of it. Somebody needs to analyze it, and that's why uh, I'm there. It's not just me, I'm just I'm part of the group. We have a whole collaboration of uh, data analysis people. But that's what, uh, uh, but that's, that's my role uh, there. And here are some examples of what can be done with it. So these, these are images taken from an existing, a current uh, survey called Sloan. And uh, what you see are these are galaxies. They may not look like galaxies for a good reason, but they are actually, uh, they are actually galaxies. Now, Sloan image almost one billion galaxies in there. So, but most of them look pretty much the same. A galaxy, a, a galaxy is a galaxy. So we, will, we want to know, we're looking for the special one, the special object. Now, that's impossible to do manually. One billion object, that's nothing that anyone can... Um, can go uh, through manually. So what we do here, these are all objects that, that were discovered at Lawrence Tech. We developed the algorithms to mine through these data and find those special galaxies, those that don't look like a uh, regular galaxy. These uh, galaxies are very important. They have a lot of information in them about the present, the, uh, and the past, and the future of the universe. That's why they're so important. So that was detected in, about, in a subset of about uh, half a million galaxies. Not a large subset, but still too large to, to inspect manually. So the algorithm was developed in 2012, and the, the, this catalog, or this part of the catalog, was uh, from 2014. And here are some... Um, that's uh, one of those galaxies. I found it in one of the military websites. I don't know what it was doing there, but that was one of the galaxies that was discovered. And pretty strange uh, triangular one, uh, pretty unusual. Now, when I first came to Lawrence Tech, that was one of the first things that I did, was to develop that tool, the Ganalyzer tool. Uh, so it has a lot of like, signal processing in that. I'm not going to get to the details. Basically, it transforms a galaxy to show it in a different way. There's a different way to look. It's the same information, just uh, visualized differently. And when you use it, uh, then you can see that many galaxies that might look like they're elliptical galaxies, like real or elliptical, what, uh, early type, in astronomy, actually has some spirality. There's some shape, some morphology in there that is not so clear when you look at it uh, 
in, as, in its regular form. And when you apply to, that's about 400,000 galaxies, when you apply it for about 400,000 galaxies, you see that many of them are not exactly what they seem to be. There's some movement in them. That's the work of, uh, of an undergrad student, uh, Levi Joycek uh, from 2014. And another thing that he does is that it's a kind of a byproduct of it, that it can tell if a galaxy rotates clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, that might not seem so important because you would think that it's just a matter of perspective, so you think that the number of clockwise galaxies in the universe might, should be equal to the number of clockwise galaxies in the universe. It should be symmetric, the universe must be symmetric. But apparently, when you apply to about 150,000 galaxies that we used here, that's not quite true. You see a consistent, sm small but consistent bias towards clockwise galaxies. The, the, the universe has more uh, galaxies that rotate clockwise compared to galaxies that uh, rotate counterclockwise. And what's even more strange is that it depends on the direction of observation. When you look at different directions, you see different asymmetry. And it has some cosine dependence. And that thing, it's an observation. You see it in the data, it's very clear. Statistically, it's very clear. But uh, it doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make, the universe is not supposed to be that way. And, um, that was right after the paper was published. That was from uh, New Scientist. I don't know if you read that magazine, but that was from, uh, from New Scientist. And for a long time, uh, I was, uh, since I was a, an, an undergrad student, I was a popular science writer. I used to write about uh, popular science to s several magazines. I used to write about uh, the discoveries made by other people. And now I see that uh, other people are starting to write about the discoveries that I make. And every once in a while, when I have some time, I continue to work on it. So that's from 2013 and 2014. I compare the colors of, of the galaxies. I found that there's some difference in the colors. Uh, clockwise galaxies are bluer than counterclockwise galaxies. That means that they're four more stars. There's, a, there's an, a, an astronomical meaning to that. And um, that wasn't, the statistical signal was not very strong until I started to use something called likelihood statistics and then that improved the statistic by a lot. So then that's basically from last week, actually. It's from last week. And um, it hasn't even been uh, officially published, uh, just been accepted, but not published yet. But what, uh, what we see here is that the, by likelihood statistics, we can see that we can really uh, predict the headedness of the galaxy. We can predict if a galaxy what it's clockwise or counterclockwise without, without even looking at, at it. And that, has, that might have some meaning, and uh, obviously there's still a lot of research to do to see that I'm getting uh, a little obsessed about it, and uh, I'm getting really curious about what's going on there. Now I'm with something completely different uh, about to art, and I've always liked art. It's something that I always liked, but I never had the talent to really do art. So I'm not creative, and I don't have a good eye to do that. So when you really like something, you don't really good at it, that's when you become a critic, so that's what I did. And uh, what we did here, we uh, developed a computer algorithm that analyzes art automatically. So each node on this graph is actually a painter. And each painter is represented just by painting, by visual data. And uh, obviously the, the, the computer doesn't know anything about the painters other than the paintings that they made, just the visual data. And, it was the, and the graph was produced automatically. So if you look at the graph, the graph is pretty much like an art historian would do. Like the classical uh, realism is the, the, uh, at the bottom. The uh, modern uh, art is uh, the upper part of, 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 the, of the tree. And everything else is organized pretty much like an art, art historian would have, um, would have organized that. And uh, it, uh, that was maybe one of the first times that shows that uh, we could show that's from 2012. We could show that uh, computers can kind of understand art, can process art, and it's, it's not something that is so uh, straightforward, so obvious. And right after it was published, then it became uh, pretty, uh, it, it was in all like uh, uh, the popular press got uh, really uh, uh, interested in that, and it was all over the news. And if you see that the one at the bottom right, that's from the, actually, that's from actually the blog of Al Kurzweil, the chief scientist of, of Google, and he wrote about it in his blog, and uh, it was in, in uh, many other sites. At the time, I didn't um, archive those stories. I didn't think it was important for some reason. So many of them are lost, but uh, some are still out there. And what we also saw that it was pretty consistent that Vincent van Gogh and Jackson Pollock were always too close to each other, and they should be. They're two completely different um, 
schools of art, but they're pretty similar, always pretty similar. So we looked deeper into that, and we saw that there's clearly uh, s much higher similarity in the mathematical level, when you mathematically analyze the paintings, Van Gogh and Pollock are much more similar than other painters that should have been more similar to Van Gogh. And again, right after that was published, uh, it was, that's a story about this article in, um, in The Economist, I think from 2011, 2012, or 2011. Um, and again, that uh, attracted some, uh, some attentions from the, from the popular press. And they, obviously, Lawrence Tech is mentioned, they're also in the, all the others one. Uh, they all uh, say that uh, the, the research was done at Lawrence Tech. And that's the last, maybe almost the last uh, piece of it uh, so far. From 2015, that's from, from last year, I, we looked deeper to what makes Pollock different than other painters, either something mathematical there. And you can clearly see that. We analyze that. I mean, you can clearly see that uh, Jackson Pollock, if you compare it to other three paintings, there's something very unique there. And we could point out what it was uh, more or less. And again, that was, uh, that's from, again, that's from last year. It was all over the news and uh, all the, this, whole, this whole thing of um, art research attracted a lot of attention from the, from the public and the, and the popular press. And that's the last part, actually. It's from two weeks ago. That's from two weeks ago. So what we did here, I worked with two psychologists, uh, Ellen Wiener from Boston College and Jenny Nissel from Yale. And what we did, we tried to compare how, uh, the artisticity perceived by humans can be compared to artisticity perceived by computers. And we found a pretty good correlation. Not uh, one correlation, obviously, but it's a statistically significant correlation. And we can see that computers, for instance, can predict whether an abstract expressionist painter, uh, a painting is, was created by a, a, a painter, a professional painter, or by a child. And we can understand, and we could also uh, analyze mathematically what makes those uh, paintings different. So that's uh, the most recent thing. Yeah, I'm going to show something different. That's, uh, that's a project, a collaboration that I was part of in uh, around 2014 uh, called Whale FM. And the collaboration, they sent boats to the ocean, each boat went there for several months, to collect data, to record data about whales, to study how whales speak. And they came back with, from all over the world with about 15,000 hours of uh, recordings. And then, again, the same question, what are we going to do with the data? How are we going to analyze 15,000 hours? That's, uh, that's a lot of data to, to listen to. There are several ways of doing it, but we automated that. And we analyzed these data automatically to see what we can discover from, from, from that database. And what we could, what we could see What we could see, that graph maybe summarizes the results, but what we could see basically is that the computer was able to, uh, uh, to find that there uh, are different dialects for so killer whales and pilot whales, and that kind of makes sense, different species, we expect different dialects. But what's more interesting here is that you see that the Norwegian killer whale at the, at the top and the Icelandic killer whales are separated. So the computer identified different dialects to killer whales uh, in Iceland and killer whales in Norway. The same with pilot whales. Norwegian pilot whales had different dialect than uh, Caribbean pilot whales. So what's interesting here is that just like people, the whales also, they have dialects in, based on different geographical location. That was the first time that it was, um, it was noticed. There were a lot of, it was 2014, but I already noticed uh, several follow-ups uh, on that and uh, researchers trying to figure out exactly what makes the difference with some discoveries on that. But, oh, thank you. And again, it was, there was a small article about it in uh, Discover magazine. I don't know if you read that. But if you can analyze whale sounds, why not music? Just doing the same thing, but with instead of uh, uh, whale calls, we can use, uh, uh, analyze songs. And that's a, a simple experiment by a student, Joe George, uh, that he collected just song music data and let the computer analyze it, see what the computer can learn from it. So the computer only has the audio data, no, nothing else about the, uh, about the musicians. And you can see that it clusters pretty much like the musical genre that we know, like the country ones are clustered together, the reggae uh, musicians are clustered together, and so on. And if you can do it from, from, to musician, we can also do it for albums. So that's like the Beatles uh, experiment that was mentioned uh, before. So these actually, 
uh, trying to analyze the album by the sound of the album. And the conveyor comes with, a, with an order uh, automatically. And the order we can see, the conveyor was able to sort it pretty much like the chronological order. And the computer obviously doesn't know the ear, it just knows the audio, but by the audio it can uh, deduce the order. And that's pretty difficult to do manually. Yeah, obviously if you know the band, if you listen to the music, yeah, you can do it, but just from if, uh, listen for the first time, it's not that easy to do. And we can see that's Queen. And uh, so Queen is also pretty much like chronological order, but we can see that the algorithm separated the 70s music from the 80s music. And if you know Queen, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> and that's ABBA. It's uh, pretty much in a chronological order, pretty solid order. They, um, and U2, uh, so you see kind of clusters around the late 80s and, and early 90s. And that can also make, I mean, if you listen to U2, it can also make some, some sense to that. And yeah, just like uh, uh, I was mentioning the introduction, it became right after it was published, it became like a, uh, it was become very famous, like uh, a lot, there was a lot of interest about it all over the world. Uh, the other some example, you can see the top left one is from Science, the magazine Science they had an article about that, and many other places. Now here's an, an example of an experiment that. Uh, Actually, it's kind of like a small experiment that went a little out of control, and that's why I'm not doing biometrics anymore. <laughs> and uh, well, biometrics, you know, the purpose of biometrics is to, um, uh, to identify people by their physiological traits, so by retina, by fingerprint, by face, by voice, many other uh, examples. What we try to do here is to see if we can identify people by their internal body part. To take an MRI, and uh, identify a person by the MRI. Now, there's no application to that, there's absolutely no application. It was a theoretical experiment to see if people can also be identified by their internal body part. <laughs> That's it. But uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the popular press did not see it that way. And right after the paper was published, I started to see all those articles like this, and uh, <laughs> that. People writing about having MRI in airports and things like that. I don't know where it came from. So it was kind of funny. I mean, maybe <laughs> some publicity to Lawrence Tech, but uh, I, it's, it's going to take me some years until I go back to, uh, to do biometrics or, or something like that. It's really, uh, that's, uh, they, they really didn't get it the way it was, <laughs> it was planned. Um, and here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. So that's an interesting story. One morning I get an email and from an anonymous person, I don't know, I, until this day I don't know who that is, sending me a link to a, an article that wasn't written by me and uh, saying that that article has a lot of, uh, most of it is copied from an article that I published in the past. Uh, so I looked at it and yeah, I saw that it's true, there are many, uh, it's, it's almost identical, it's copied and pasted basically, including the figures and everything. So uh, yeah, so, uh, I looked into, but then I looked deeper into it, and then that was very surprising that it's not, it wasn't just one article. I started to find all those articles, about 40 articles by almost 100 different people from different countries, probably don't even know about each other, all copying from the same paper that I, till this day, I don't know what was so special in that paper to, <laughs> to copy from, but it was about 40 people, and probably there's more now, I'm not, I haven't checked it for several years, but probably there, there's more now. And uh, all of them copied from that uh, small paper, including the figures and uh, the figures were pixelated. I made them with like an old Linux machine. I was always worried that someone might see them. So I would, and then I the people just copy them as is with the pixelated figures, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, but then when I saw that, I started to contact the editors and hey, you have that uh, thing copied from uh, my papers, why don't you uh, retract it and remove it? And because uh, they were also cited, like hundreds of citations, these, uh, these articles collected. So, uh, but I didn't get responses, not from any of the publishers, I didn't get response. And uh, then, that's the story about it in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education. They also tried to get responses, and they did get some response. They did respond back, the editors, but they did not remove uh, the article. It's still hanging in there. So even if you look now, 
even if you look now, so that's from uh, when I prepared the slideshow, that's from like uh, probably a week ago or two weeks ago. So the article is still there. The IEEE is offering them for sale and it's all like copied and pasted one word by word, uh, including the figures. And it's still there. Every once in a while I send them an email, I ask them what, what they're gonna do about it. Still, oh, we're still checking that. And uh, it's been like from 2011, I believe. So, so that, that's all I have to show today. Um, if you have, well, but here's some, um, some of the grants that uh, supported me through that and still, and, and I still get support from, from those grants. But uh, the important thing is that these grants are just about 10% of what I needed to work. The 90% is the support, uh, the support that you f get the sense of, of it from the introduction, the support uh, from the chair, from dean, also from provost and president. To, uh, to go into this uh, direction, to do these things, to start new things, uh, without being too worried about what's gonna do if, if it doesn't work, what's gonna do if, if, if I fail. And that's the 90% of, of it, not, the, not necessarily the, the grants. And uh, you know, when you start something new, they're always, uh, you always uh, think of what's, what's gonna happen if I fail, what's gonna happen if, if it doesn't work. And uh, if you don't get the support, it's really hard to do something new, it's really hard to try. So uh, the, the support is what led to, to everything that I showed today. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll be really happy to answer. So it's told me if I sit in the first row, I have to ask questions. But it's not a question, it's actually a suggestion for you. Mm -hmm. So next time you have to write your, your end of the term evaluation, this paper was cited by 15 people and it was plagiarized by 150 people. Might be a benefit that way. Oh. Uh, with the Pollock experiment, have you been asked to do work on art authentication? Because as you know, there's a number of famous trials and things like that. Or people want to harness this computing to, to make sure that they're buying a $5 million painting that actually is what it says it is. Exactly. And there are some... Uh, there was some uh, also things in the media that I didn't show about that. I was interviewed about that in several different places. I gave some interviews about that. But I have to tell you that since that first Pollock work was published, every like once a week or once every two weeks, I get an email from someone who has a Pollock painting and they want to give me the painting and ask me to verify that, that, that Pollock, ask me if it's a Pollock or not. My uh, urge to reply is, I didn't check it, I didn't check it, but it's not a Pollock. That's what <laughs> I want to, <laughs> uh, but I don't, I don't do it because the whole field of art authentication, that's, it's, it's a different field, it's, it's strange to me. The way they work, they have a very solid methods and I just don't want to get into that field, so I, I don't do that. Uh, some people try to, uh, uh, to use the, the algorithms that I, uh, that I use, but they really uh, into proving that their work, they really, they really have, an, uh, have an agenda. So sometimes it, it ends up uh, not quite as, as I want it to be. So I, I just don't, I, I prefer to stay away from that, uh, from that world. So, so the question about the research uh, associated with the music, uh, growing up, I, c I couldn't separate the lyrics from the uh, from the musical notes and the structure. Uh, in your research, was it just the music, or was it both? And um, particularly with a band like U2, where it's very timely, uh, politically timely uh, lyrics, that would identify 1982 or 1979. Uh, so how did that all get embedded in your research? Well, it's funny you should ask. Uh, the, what I showed is based on the audio only, but we're working on lyrics right now. And in fact, uh, yeah, there he is, George, George Cheryl. And we're working together on analyzing lyrics, exactly like you said. And then analyzing the lyrics, see what happened with the lyrics, how lyrics change and then combining that with the music. So yeah, we're working on it right now. We don't have results yet, but soon, next year, next uh, year's research day, uh, George is mm, probably will present his work. You'll, you'll get better answers.
wrap, wrap, can you wrap us up a little bit with the first point that you made about e-science? For me, I find that extremely timely and really exciting, and it would be just great if you could give me some future direction, some comments on what would you recommend for both the young investigators and the seasoned or moving along with their careers investigators? Okay, so that depends, that, that's a good question. It depends on really what, uh, what your part in the process is. Because virtualization means that each person contributes something and the people uh, involved in the experiment don't necessarily need to know about each other. So one person can contrib contribute the data, one person can contribute the hypothesis, another p person can contribute the analysis. They all work on the same experiment, they don't necessarily know each other. So what I can tell you what I take from that, I, my part is, to, uh, is the data processing. So I take, I look around me to see what data are out there, and there's a lot of data out there, a lot of data out there. There's much more data than a ability to analyze it. I'd go there and look what data are there, take this data and start processing it either by myself or with others. Sometimes I work with others, like with the whales, for instance, that, uh, that, 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 that was a collaboration. But I don't need to work with others if I don't want to. I can also, or, or if I don't have the right collaborators, I can work by myself. So my starting point is the data, getting good data, a lot of data out there. And each data, like the, what I showed from before, the, the student that uh, analyzed the aging process, that uh, collecting the database took five years or 10 years actually, 10 years because it's longitudinal, and it cost them about $25 million to collect the data. Now we get the data without making that investment, without waiting five or 10 years, and with, without investing $25 million, but we got it already prepared for us, and we could use it. So that's a very, very strong tool that we could use. We are actually, I, could, I wanted to follow up for our young scientists that are here, is how do you actually find the data? Do you know, get the data of the, the whales is very different than getting the data of the music. That, so what is the process that you have? Because this is all about big data, right? And how are you going to be able to, to analyze it? So what is the process that you use to actually find the data? Okay, so uh, these, uh, all of these projects are not secret. They're all uh, out there because they're all funded externally. All of these projects are either by a private foundation or by the government. So they're all f funded uh, externally. And each project like that comes with uh, data management disclosure. So they have to share the data under cir certain cir circumstances, but they have to share the data. And, the, 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 and they want people to use the, their data. They are out there. Uh, once you know about them, and you learn about them from conferences, from, from papers that they publish, from things like that, it, it, that goes for the, the traditional scientific communication, uh, at least in my case. Sometimes you hear about it from other people. Uh, but that goes more in the traditional way. But once you hear about it, getting the data is becoming much easier. People are willing to share the data. They have to share the data. They're required by the, the, the agreement that they, uh, that they made. And they want to share the data. They want people to use uh, to use the data. They don't want to, want you to just sit uh, there. So just like with the galaxy experiment, that for instance, we don't even need to ask anybody. I mean, it's out there. You just you, it's not it, it's a huge it's a gigantic data. It's not something that you can download to your laptop. Uh, it's not like that. But you can still work with it. They have like uh, an interface that you can that you can work with that and get w uh, whatever data you need. So it's all there. Also the whales now they put it like on the, on the Amazon cloud. So anyone can use that too. So it's just like looking around uh, through the traditional communication and then finding the data, then it becomes less traditional. Now, when we were young, uh, we all learned uh, to do research uh, in a following an experimental protocol that is like Galilean. So uh, Galilean uh, also, um, Francis Bacon, uh, they said, uh, you got an hypothesis, then you uh, build up an experiment, you do the experiment, and you verify if your hypothesis is confirmed or not. Now, but uh, with the um, e-science, uh, we are moving towards, uh, actually, this is my question, are we moving towards a science without hypothesis? Well, the science will still have hypothesis. The experiment, or the way the, wor the, the way the experiment is being done does not start with hypothesis. For instance, the LSST example that I showed. Now, they're building a telescope. They don't necessarily have a, a certain hypothesis that they want to check. 
they're building that, and it's a $2 billion project, okay? It's not, uh, it's not something small. But they're starting a $2 billion project without a certain project because they know, okay, we'll find something. People will come up with their own hypothesis use, and they will use our data products to prove or disprove their hypothesis. So they're not worried about that. They're worried about what they're really worried about is creating the environment to make hypotheses and to prove or disprove them. Not to rather, so it doesn't start from an hypothesis, okay, we have uh, that hypothesis, let's build a telescope to prove it. So that's not how LSST works, and that's just an example. Many other uh, uh, of the, of the, the, the primary uh, scientific products, they work that way. Hi. Uh, one thing that I noted from your presentation is how you cross so many dis different disciplinary boundaries. And I think a lot of people spend entire, entire careers within one tiny subfield of a larger field. So how much do you find you need to kind of start over with your knowledge, and how much are you able to apply knowledge from one field to another? I, I try to, you're, you're right, I, I try to do it as, as efficiently as possible. It's not always as efficient as, or, as I want. The reason it's so uh, diverse is because I work a lot with students. I want to do, uh, uh, to, to work with students, but I don't want to, do, to use the model that, uh, you know, the students are my assistant, my research assistant. I know that model exists, that's the common model, but I don't necessarily like that model. I want the student to lead the research and I'll be their assistant. I'll, I'll help them do the research that they're interested in. And sometimes they're interested in all different things, like music, that I, I got to music because of a student that was interested in that. And I do research about football, for instance. I publish peer-reviewed papers about football because that's what one of the students uh, is interested in. So that's, that's, why it's, uh, uh, that's why it's so diverse. So, uh, but I do try to use uh, uh, knowledge that I already have as much as possible, but uh, oh, there's there always a learning curve, and I don't necessarily think it's a, it's a, it's a negative thing. I mean, uh, I get to learn from each of these projects. I get to learn something new. So, so. All right, we'll do a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap it up. So let me come back over here to our librarian. So I'm sure he's got a question on big data and the library. <laughs> This it really is a follow-up to what you were saying earlier about big data, but I see you have a reference up there to the Midwest Hub, and I just wondered if you could comment, is Lawrence Tech putting data into that, or how are we using it? Okay, well, the Hub is just forming right now. The Hub is just forming. We had few meetings. It started last year. We only met for the first time. That's before we wrote the proposal to the NSF. The, propo the NSF uh, gave us the grant, I think, four months ago, uh, no, uh, in, in January, so yeah, so it was three, mo uh, three months ago. And the, f the, the, the hub is just starting. The hub is just starting, we're just figuring out what the hub is going to be. The hub doesn't have any data right now, so we don't get data or contribute data to the hub. We're just seeing what the hub is going to be and we don't know, none of us knows yet. So I joined the hub since it started in the last year since our initial share. Now I'm on the, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the steering committee of the hub. So uh, we're about, uh, the steering committee is pretty small, it's 15 people, but the hub itself is of 200 people right now, I think it, it, it grows pretty quickly. Uh, but we're still shaping it, we're still under the sign what kind of government uh, that the hub is gonna be, and what uh, roles it's gonna, uh, it's, it's, it's going to serve, and uh, what are the, the, sh uh, the stakeholders. Uh, wh who are the players, and it's all very vague right now, so I, I, I can't tell you a whole lot about the habit, except that we're working on it. We're working on it, we're gonna, uh, and we're, we're gonna come up with something. It's the first time that the NSF is doing something like that. Normally the NSF gives you a grant, it's for like a certain project that have a sort of specific goal. Here they give uh, the uh, funding to these hubs to start do something, and it's not really defined. Do something with big data, whatever you think is right. And that's the, the NSF don't normally work that way. That's the first time they're trying to do it, and uh, they're really trying to make that uh, to make that work. So I'm going in two weeks. I'm going to Washington. We have like the big data meeting in, in, in Washington D.C. Uh, last month I was in um, in Chicago. We met again with just with the Midwest Hub. We're still working on it. Okay, that's. I'm really excited that you're part of this steering committee. I was at a library function last summer, and um, I think the fellow who's maybe chairing it from U of M, Ather something, Atherton, Atherley. Uh, Brian, Ath Brian Athey is the, yeah, is the Athey. person. Okay, oh, okay, yeah. He did a presentation at the meeting that I was at, 
and he was just so enthusiastic. And Kathy and I were, were hoping that Lawrence Tech would be involved. So that's wonderful. Well, it's for the camera. I want to get it for our posterity's sake, because we always archive these each year. So pardon me for walking over to you. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll have a couple more questions, folks, and then lunch and posters. Shamir, I'm fascinated by your research, especially in space. Now, uh, the data that you have been receiving, uh, do you think it can support that chaos theory of the universe? Well, we'll see, because the chaos theory, because if you saw the, what I presented about it, it's actually uh, conflicts with the chaos theory of the universe. It's proposed that the data shows something different if we understand the data the way, the way we understand it. So, uh, so we'll see. Uh, right now, my, uh, my agenda is to see if that's, if that's real. And if it's real, then the chaos theory of the universe might need to be revisited. Most likely that it's just something instrumental. Now the, 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 the signal is, is, is true, the signal is real, but it could be, it's most likely instrumental rather than cosmological. So, but we're still looking at it. It's still difficult to m figure out what exactly and what could possibly cause something like that to happen. Thank you, Dean Mershub. Over to George in physics. Thanks, Lior is great. I just want to follow up on, on Franco's question and, and sort of like expand on, on your answer because a lot of the discussion before, before your talk was, was about this and that suggesting that there's a paradigm shift in science. And I'd like to point out that, that it's not new to science to sort of do the see what's out there type of thing. What's, what's new is the availability for people with different tools to look at the data. That's what's new. because. So what's going to happen from the see what's out there and someone new like Shamir that's coming and finding new connections is someone's going to say, okay, this is great. I need to come up with a theory of this. Let me refine a hypothesis that tests what you found. And then let's do another study that's very specific and hypothesis based with the, with the same, looking for the same information again. And that's not new in science. What's new is that this is a, like someone who's studying, say, astrophysics their whole life is not developing a tool like Lior has. And then, and then if you make that available to other people, people with those tools can see there's an application here that no one else has seen before, and that's where the paradigm shift is. Well, probably, uh, but, but it's all part of the same story because the, the tools are only needed because of the virtualizations. Then you could do something with, the, with, with those tools. And I can tell you that, for, I, I gave you two examples, LSST and Sloan. Sloan started in 2003. Now, the NSF did not support Sloan. It's, it's private uh, funding. This, it's by, that's why it's called Sloan, it's the Sloan Foundation that funded it. So, um, because at the time, uh, it was more difficult to start uh, these things. Now, LSST, the uh, NSF funded it very generously. Now, it's more common, and, and, and you, can, uh, you can consider the, the, the National Science Foundation as the traditional uh, approach to science. They're fairly conservative, uh, conservative about it. But uh, now, with LSST, they are willing to, uh, to give the funding. So you see that it, there is a shift in, the, uh, in how, yeah, it existed. It, 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 it always has existed. I agree with that. But there's a shift becoming much more prevalent. And the tools are, more, uh, are now uh, needed because of that. Yeah, if the data weren't available, then only two or three people that sit closely to the data can analyze it. People who develop tools might not even know that these tools are needed. So it's all part of it. So thank you, everybody. Congratulations, Lior. <laughs>
And so we have a uh, certificate. There you go. Since Dr. Modgill is not here, he couldn't sign it, so he has to come back. When Dr. Modgill comes back, and we will have another photo, and Dr. Modgill will sign it. In addition to that, there is a check that comes with it. But uh, again, unfortunately, because Dr. Modgill is not here, <laughs> and, and the money comes from, uh, from his budget, when Dr. Modgill comes back, again, we will, be, we will have a meeting all together and uh, the, the re it will, your uh, action will be completed. Okay, <laughs> thank you. But anyway. Marit, come up here. Come on, come on, yeah. We'll take a picture here. We'll take a picture first. And then yeah. So now we're gonna do the pictures and you can go for break for lunch and then those faculty and students that still need to pick up your posters, please go to the print desk and pick them up and hang them.